So what about the implicit function theorem? In this particular case, going a little deep in this particular, this particular theorem, uh, Rudin and Apostle, which are really the more advanced mathematical analysis books that I have, really came in handy. And so if we read from, uh, from Apostle, and I wrote notes about it, therefore I don't have to show the part in the book uh, that talks about it because the print isn't so great. Okay, so what does Apostle say about the implicit function theorem? He says, uh, the equation of a curve in the xy plane can be expressed either in an implicit form, such as y to a equals f to the x, f of x, or an implicit form, that's why it's called the implicit function, such as f of x, y equals zero. However, if we're given a function, uh, an equation of the form f of x, y equals zero, this does not necessarily re represent the function. He uses the example of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals 5, or x squared plus y squared minus 5 equals 0. It is not really a function, because you, when you make a cut along the y-axis, in the, in the direction of the y-axis, you can get two points, so it's not a function. So then the equation f of y, x equals 0 does always represent a relation, namely that set of all pairs x, y, which satisfy the equation. When is the relation defined by f of x, y equals 0 also a function? When can we solve explicitly an f of x, y for y in terms of x, yielding a unique solution? So the implicit function theorem deals with this question locally. So it's not a global theorem, it's a local theorem. Uh, the implicit function theorem tells us that given a point x0, y0, such that the function, uh, the relation actually, f of x0, y0 equals 0, under certain conditions, there will be a neighborhood, there will be a neighborhood of x0, of x y0, such that in this neighborhood, the relation defined by f, y, f of x, y equals 0 is also a function. The conditions are that f and the derivatives of f be continuous in some neighborhood of x0, y0, and that the, the derivatives do not equal 0. Right. So that's a great explanation. Apostle really hit it out of the park here. Used that. Then went into Rudin, and Rudin has a, uh, an example. As always, Rudin has the best examples. The explanations for the theorem sometimes are really hardcore poetry. Very difficult to read sometimes. But Rudin's example is really, really good. He takes, he's got two functions, f of 1, f of 2, and it's got uh, the it's got x1, x2, and then y1, y2, y3. These are the functions. And then when you do the, uh, the uh, Jacobian and you evaluate it at a certain point for which the function is true, then you take the x1, x2 func uh, submatrix and you can invert it, right? So it's invertible. And then you multiply it by the other uh, matrix to get values that solve, that tell you local values for which what is a relation but not really a function now is a function. Great, great stuff. So there you have it, that's Rudin. And then of course if I show you where it is in Apostle, just for the sake of showing what it looks like in the book, this is what I was reading from, okay? And all the way in here, all this. All right, so very useful goes on further. Uh, Wade did a good job, but I really, I needed more. I needed more. And then, of course, uh, Prater and Murray has a whole section. Uh, and, of course, in the analysis book, this gets rewritten in a much, much, in a brief way. So it's much better to read it in this original form. And so he's got a whole se a whole mini chapter titled Implicit Function Theorems and then Transformations because the inverse function theorem also comes in and there's sort of like a twofer. Uh, so yeah, I used this chapter in this wonderful book. Uh, right, show it like that so you can read it there. And uh, I used it, used the examples, read through all of them, and then I was able to understand what it was that I was doing. And so that is my brief deep dive into the implicit function theorem.